new teachers and, and try, try fun new things. So, um, so I guess uh, with that said, let me let me jump right into this. Let me share my screen, put some slides up for you, and I'm gonna be good and open this chat window so I can follow it. Um, please, please, at any time, um, interrupt me, unmute, and ask questions. Totally cool. Um, I have more slides than you know than I need to go through, so I'm always actually really happy to get sidetracked and just talk to you guys. So, whatever it is you guys want to chat about is the most important thing to me. But I'll tell you guys, you know, just as the the general background. So my name is is Brandon Rodriguez. I work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I'm in the education department, even though I'm a chemist by trade. So, kind of a important detail for today is that actually a teacher as well. So JPL has been really supportive and lets me teach part-time in addition to my work at NASA. So for the last seven years, I've been teaching chemistry and physics, um, whatever my school needs, uh, and just kind of teach a couple periods in the morning before going into work. So here are my, my kiddos uh, from a couple years ago. You can tell not only because they're not wearing masks, but because I look 10 years younger because it's before COVID time. So, you know, a lot of a lot of age here and mostly in the waste area. Um, but uh, spoiled kids, man, these kids are so lucky because, you know, we take field trips out to JPL. They get all the, the visitors from, uh, you know, different scientists and engineers. And it's really, really awesome. I've taught at the college level as well. So I taught at Pasadena City College. I teach at Cal Poly Pomona. I've taught at UC Riverside. Um, just kind of adjunct gigs because I, you know, I, I just I really love teaching both on the science side, but also in the education game as well. So I've taught uh, uh, like pedagogy classes, science equity classes, and stuff like that. So if you're ever interested in talking about that and just kind of learning more, you just want to, you know, brainstorm about cool, you know, questions in education. Please, please, you know, reach out. Oh, cool, Ellie's Ellie's on my team. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I teach the uh, um, Earth Science for Educators class there. It's it's super fun, super fun. And most of all, these are my, my kiddos from last year. Uh, so, you know, so nice to be back teaching lab science. I mean, it is just impossible to do in a remote scenario. And we kind of heard in the opening sessions, like uh, talking about that, you know, being able to see that that learning gap now. And I, I think just in practical sciences, right, in hands-on sciences, I mean, that's it's the most pronounced space for that. So being back, even with masks, as, as kind of nervous as I was at the beginning and, you know, was concerned about safety. I mean, there's just no substitute for um, what what these kids get in being in a, in a hands-on lab. Um, I see a question about my email address. Yeah, I'll absolutely, I think it's my very last slide is my email address. And yeah, and I'm sociopathic about email response. So you'll, you'll definitely hear from me very quickly. I mentioned too that, you know, so again, you know, I think the science component is more important, but, but I'm a scientist as, uh, you know, um, as, as well as a teacher and it's, you know, my, my gig is chemistry, but the my my real passion is is teaching. So I've been uh, I worked as a chemist in for eight years in the private sector. Uh, I worked for a company called Dow Chemical, and uh, really had a great gig where I was actually more of a kind of like a traveler, if you will. Like it was kind of like a, a starting off business ideas in different countries. So I was in Brazil for several months. I was in China for a year, Australia, and uh, I I think that's you know I kind of highlight that because I. I want you guys to know, and I want your students to know that what we think science is and how we portray it in school is just so wildly minimalistic, right? We, we teach biology, chemistry, physics, and we say, do you want to be a scientist? And it's like, that is not what science looks like at all. Um, you know, so very rarely do we talk about science being outside of the lab, being patent lawyers, being, you know, scale up engineers, like being consultants, right? Like those types of things. And those are all science careers as well. And uh, I think it's important to highlight. It's tragic to me that we describe science as like, oh, I'm going to be a nurse, right? And it's like, if you're like science, like you're a nurse or a doctor based on gender, which is, you know, again, also very tragic. But very few people say like, oh, I'm going to be a cosmologist or, you know, an astrophysicist or something like that. Like those are, those are really exciting careers and we, we have to try our best to represent them as, as much as possible. One of the things I hope you guys take away today is effectively, if nothing else, other than like some, some cheesy jokes, like there's a website where you are going to find all of the activities I'm going to do with you today and hundreds of others. And this, this should be your one-stop shop. Like I can't, I can't stress enough, especially for new teachers. If you're still writing your own lesson plans, 
that's burnout, right? Like yeah, that's that's time not well spent. Go steal lesson plans from other people and let one of those other people be me. So we have hundreds and hundreds of activities online. They're already lesson planned for you in a 5D model. We already have assessment, answer keys, student worksheets, all on PDF. Um, we have engage videos. We have extension activities, stuff like that. It's all done. And that's, that's because my team is a small team of people like me. We're all teachers. We're all scientists. So we can write good content based on what's really happening in the scientific world, but we can frame it with the language of your four walls as an educator. But those are the types of activities that we think work well with kids and don't put a lot of work on you, right? I don't need you to learn to be an astrophysicist. I need you to hit print, right? And like, it's all done for you. That's that's the beauty. So um, I, I hope you guys will, will check out that website and kind of uh, dig around on it. In fact, I'll, I'll walk through it just a little bit for you. So the, the website looks a, a little bit like this. You can see there's some sections up here to play with. The teach section is probably your best bet, and that's where you'll find a bunch of activities. Um, like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll walk through this in just a second. And then the learn section is actually something we did in response to COVID, which is more student-driven activities. So these are things that are not you at the front, but something that you would assign. For the last couple of years, it's something like I would put in my Edmodo or Google Classroom and say, here are stepwise with photos, instructions of activities. You do it. You don't need me. You can do it at home because it's really basic materials like maybe paper or scissors. And then post your results to the Google Classroom for everyone to see. So teach is obviously more you at the front of the classroom led. And then learn is like, oh, kids can do it on their own. And maybe this is a good time to just quickly show you. So here's the website. And here you can see that teach and learn up here. And if I go to teach really quickly, you'll see that the activities are broken down by types, by subject, by grades, aligned to NGSS standards for you. And then you can pick topics or just search around if you want. So if I pick uh, an activity that I know, this is like our egg drop challenge, for example, and I open this up. What I'll see is, again, NGSS standards already there for me, student worksheet on PDF. I have translated this one into Spanish. I haven't translated all the activities in Spanish because one, I don't have enough time in a day, and two, my academic Spanish is terrible. So I'm working on that. But some of these are in Spanish for you. Materials you'll need. And then same thing again, answer keys, rubrics, pictures of the activities, discussion questions. Again, everything's done. If it's not done, I didn't do my job. So if you have to do more work, um, you know, please let me know so that we can make this make this better for you. But I hope you'll see that like these are the kind of things that again are just really ready for you guys to take off the shelf. And uh, again, the same thing for the learn section, which will be again a little bit more student focused. And you'll see like it doesn't have standards and you know material. Right? It's more written, picture wise, step wise for you to follow along with the kids. So, so that's kind of my pitch. I saw a, a hope for the link, so I'm just going to throw that in the chat right now for you. And that's the website. So that's the that's kind of our big our big pitch to you guys in terms of I, what I hope are great resources for you guys to to be able to tinker with. So, with that being said, let's uh, let's jump in. Let's actually. Oh well, let me let me pause pause and uh, let me check with you guys. Questions so far on the on the website or JPL resources or anything like that before I do some activities with you guys. Cool. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you guys agree. And again, please, uh, we are only as great as the communication with the people that use the website. So you can always reach out and be like, hey, I found this one a little difficult or, or this one worked really well. My currency is like photos of you guys and your kids like having a good time. So please feel free to always like send pictures and be like, hey, this is us doing this activity and, we, and it was awesome. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's always really heartwarming to know that it's actually being used and, and being successful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if you're, if you're still uh, asking to do um, lesson plans, I'm telling you, copy, copy, paste like this. Teachers are just professional thieves, right? We can't, um, we can't be starting from scratch all the time. It's ridiculous. Emily's asking about like tours and stuff. Yeah. So there are two ways to do tours at JPL. First is like the public tours and that's for students and like the general public and stuff like that. And it's like big groups, right? So if you're like 
taking a school field trip of 80 people out there or something like that. And if you just search for JPL public tours, you'll see a, a reservation system. However, that wait list is obviously very large because everyone's trying to get in. I do have one small superpower at work, which is I can have a meeting with you um, that would put you at the front of the line. So if you ever want to have a meeting with me, email me and bring your staff and like, let's talk. What I will trade you is a tour at JPL. If you will talk to me about activities and like bring your staff and say like, Hey, let's, what can we do for your students? I'm always happy to do that, especially for schools. You know, I had a couple of teachers telling me, Hey, like I'm in on science, but the rest of my team's not. Maybe if we brought them all out, that would be like a little motivating and maybe that would get them on board. What a great idea, right? A hundred percent behind that idea. So if that's the kind of thing that I can help out with, I'd be, I'd be happy to do. Naturally, I can't have a meeting with 60, you know, fourth graders. So we got to do it within the confines of reason. If you think of anything else, please, again, interrupt me wildly, but let's, let's play. I, I brought all these toys on vacation, so we might as well use them. All right, so I'll share my screen again. Let's get some slides up. My, my pitch on this kind of proposal here was not actually to run through a ton of science or to show you guys like one big activity. As, as you can kind of see from the title, the game was how can I just kind of break up lecture with some more demos, right? Like what can I do to just, you know, in a long day, I teach a, a school with block schedule. So like in an hour and a half, I can't lecture the whole time, right? So what am I doing to kind of like break that up? And we, we do a lot of labs, as you can probably imagine in my class, but like for those longer slide heavy days, what can I do to just kind of um, kind of break it up and have a have just a quick five cent demo? So that's what I want to talk to you guys about. One of the things that I like to, to talk about with students is, for example, how we find uh, exoplanets. How do we find planets that are orbiting other stars in the solar system? Uh, not in our solar system, in, in other solar systems. One of the ways that we do that is what's called the transit method. So this animation is showing how this works. Effectively, we wait for an eclipse, if you will. So the planet on another, uh, orbiting another star crosses in front of its star and the star gets a little darker. It blocks out a little bit of light as it passes by. Now, obviously you can't just see this with your naked eye very easily, but with a good telescope, you can actually see the star dim and if you kind of think about this, the time that it takes for it to cross tells you how fast the planet is moving, right? So if it stays dim for a long time, then the planet is moving slowly and vice versa. It also tells us how big the planet is. If it blocks out more of the light, then we know it's a bigger planet versus a smaller planet. So the transit method is kind of a very, a very nice way to be able to see planets orbiting other stars. I'm curious, and this picture is kind of, in a way, the answer I'm looking for. Do you guys see a problem with the transit method? Is there like a clear limitation why this might not work all the time? Will the sun move? Oh, it, it does move, actually, which gets to my next slide. So that's really, that's a good one. But if you look at exactly this picture, why would the transit method not be great? Remember, space is three-dimensional, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Tammy's got it, right? So the angle is important here. Like, it's not like every single solar system in the universe goes like this, right? So I might be waiting forever, but if the alignment looks like it looks like here on the screen right now, well, that star and that planet will never cross right? It'll never cross in front. So sometimes the transit method actually will never happen. So you need that alignment in between you, the planet, and the star. But Jane actually called a, a cool response to this is to use a different method here, which is a gravitational one. So again, not with your naked eye, but with a very, very good telescope, what you can actually see is that gravity is a two-way street. So even though we think of Earth being pulled on by the sun, the truth is that we actually pull on the sun as well. So the star moves too, just moves a lot less, right? But it does wiggle. We can actually see that wiggle in space as well. Kind of like a big person swinging around a child, right? You feel like you can still notice that you're being pulled as well. 
And then the last method, oops, uh, so, you know, again, this is helpful for, you know, kind of things like the habitable zone, looking for those, those planets that are in the right, the right place, right? The, the last method I wanted to show you guys is effectively what Einstein taught us. Einstein, and, and again, it's just sounds like science fiction, was able to show that the fabric of space-time changes as gravity passes through it. And we can actually see light bending, the curvature of space, as things with gravity move through the universe, which is, which is kind of like wild. It's such a wild thing to think about, right? I to show that just one more time. So as a star, a heavy star moves through the universe, we can actually see light curve around it. Uh, and that's kind of that's kind of cool to think about, right? And this is where we get into like all sorts of crazy, trippy ideas, right, about space time. So why do I care about this? Well, I care about this because of things like this. What you're seeing here is actually uh, between a distant galaxy, there is a black hole black hole being much larger, much more gravity than a star. And you can see light bending around, right? I mean, which is just, it's so cool. It looks kind of like uh, looking through a glass, right? Like a Coke bottle or something like that. So you can kind of see a picture of the same thing here, right? Like this is where light is curving around objects with heavy gravity, like a bunch of, like a cluster of stars, for example. And one of the things that, that does this is something called dark matter. And dark matter is super interesting to me as a chemist because I learned in chemistry class that like the periodic table was the entire fabric of the universe, right? Everything was made on the periodic table and that's wildly incorrect. Now we know that the periodic table makes up about 4% of the universe and that a giant chunk of this like unknown material is called dark matter. We don't know what it is. We can't see it. We can't touch it, but it has gravity. So one of the, the ways I want to kind of show this to you, and maybe I should like pin myself so I can see here, is since we can't see dark matter, my question to you guys is how do we know it's there? And that's kind of like a big idea. So what I did is I made two clusters of universes for you. And here they are. Here's universe one, and here's universe two. Now, looking at these, you can pretty quickly tell which one of them has dark matter in it, right? Like, I know you guys can see that one of them has dark matter, but my question to you is, how do you know? How do you know that one of them has the dark matter in it? And there are a lot of good answers, but I'm curious what you guys think. So depending on whether you have screen switch, right? I think you know this one doesn't have it and this one does, but I want you to tell me how you know. What do you guys think? I'll hold them up so you can see. Yeah, okay, okay, so so many good ones, right? So like for Solomon, you're saying one of them has volume compared to the other. And like, assume that this is like filled to the top. So let's assume it looks like this. So they have the same volume, right? But Emily is kind of saying, oh, there's, you can maybe see the difference in gravity. You can't feel it, but how can I feel it? Like, I definitely know one of these has water in it. How do I know that? Yeah, exactly, Tammy, perfect, perfect, right? Yeah, so Tammy and Emily get for, for sure. This one's heavier and I can feel it, you can't, but I can. I really like what Gwendolyn said too. If I were to do this, it's pretty clear which one has dark matter in it as well, right? So yeah, the movement through dark matter tells me a lot as well. If there's restricted motion, yeah, that's pretty good too. And of course, the other thing, if I kind of hold these up to the light, two windows behind me, that worked nicely. We can see that bending of the light, just like I was talking about too, right? This one's refracting light and this one is not, right? So yeah, this is how, this is how we do it. Like literally, this is how, we don't know much about dark matter, but we know it's got those three effects and this is how we track it, which is kind of wild to think about. So dark matter is, I think, going to absolutely change the way we, we view the universe. We have to we got to figure it out. We have no clue what it is. So we just gave it a cool name to make it sound exciting, right? Let me show you guys another one. Let's talk more about cool, cool nerd stuff here. Now I'm in the zone. So this is um, a nebula that I study at work. Uh, that's called IC417. Beautiful name for a beautiful nebula. And what you can see here is, if you can kind of imagine with me, I think you guys can see my cursor. Imagine 
a star exploded somewhere over here. So there's a supernova here. And that supernova pushed the dust out. So you can kind of see like the edge of the bubble here, if you can imagine that with me. So like all of that dust is being forced this way. And the force of that dust is causing everything in here to collide. This process is called accretion, and that's how stars are formed. So all of these guys here, these orange dots in this string right here, those are brand new stars that just turned on. So what we're doing is we're studying how star formation kind of kicks off. What does it mean to start being a star? You can imagine I've got a lot of other stars in my, in my frame here, but I really just want to look at these ones. These are the ones I care about. So how do I, how do, I do that? How do I focus on just a few stars? Well, I got very, very lucky, and I got to fly on a mission called SOFIA. If you've heard of this, it is a, a, a giant telescope on the back of a, of a plane, and it flies at about 44,000 feet, so significantly higher than a, than a normal plane. And we open this back door here, this hatch, and there's a three-meter telescope in the back, and you do this to get above the air, right, to get above water vapor and stuff like that that interferes with the, with the telescope. And you take telescope data somehow from a plane. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, like, planes are pretty shaky. Like, how do you possibly point a telescope? Uh, yeah, absolutely right. The whole system is set up on this, like, motion dampening thing. So you move, but the telescope doesn't move. Um, so this is us in the, uh, getting ready for takeoff. This is the telescope out the back. So this is what we see. And then on the other side, of, you can see all this, like, motion dampening material here. On the other side of that is the gate with the telescope pointed out the back. So now we're staring out into the sky, looking at stars without the atmosphere kind of getting in the way. But my problem is, and I put some links in here for you guys too. My problem is that <laughs> I've got all those other stars in the way and I've got to figure out how to just see the ones that I want. How do I do that? Well, basically what I do is I use filters. If you guys kind of have ever geeked out on astronomy, you know that stars have different colors and the colors correspond to how old they are, how hot they are, et cetera, right? Blue stars tend to be young, very, very big, very, very hot. Darker red stars, smaller, not so hot. If you can imagine with me, I think I've got a good dark shirt for this, yeah. If I've got old stars and young stars next to each other, there we go, that looks pretty good, there we go. So I've got two stars here, and you can see this is a 20 cent LED and a watch battery, by the way. So if I have a hot young star and an old star here, and I want to only see one of them, and I've got thousands of these, like in that picture, thousands of these, what I do is I apply a filter so that I only see the ones I want. Using effectively color filters, I can turn on or off which stars I want to be able to see at any point in time. And I can obviously do the converse, right? So if I want to see only the red stars, I can do that as well. This is obviously like a silly reduction. I don't use cellophane from the theater department. I use like very, very nice filters, but the, I mean, the principle is exactly the same. And what's really cool about this is that I don't need to just use visible light. Our universe, right, the electromagnetic spectrum is so much bigger than visible light. So one of the other things that I use is I use infrared. Infrared allows us to see heat. You've ever seen like the Predator movies, everyone knows this, right? So it's like the camera that will allow you to see heat. So if I want, I can do the same thing and apply some filters. For example, here is a me with an infrared camera. That's what I look like, looking good. But what if I want to turn off certain wavelengths in the infrared. Well, I can do that too. So let's do a little magic trick together. So there's me. And if I want to turn me off, I do this. So I've filtered myself out from infrared, but you can still see me, right? So I'm even just plexiglass like this is a infrared filter, but not a visible light filter. So if I want to turn on or off visible light versus heat, I can do that as well, just with a piece of glass. So the same thing, I can kind of effectively turn myself back on by removing one of the filters at any point in time. So it's kind of cool. Like, again, we can select which wavelength of light we want to see. That way we're only 
getting that small subset and not being blinded by way too many stars in the sky, which makes it just so, so difficult. We have a bunch of activities doing exactly this. I'll show you some pictures real quick. What we did is um, we took uh, a couple plants from like the hardware store and we watered some of them, but not others. And as a result, they got stressed. And so their temperature changes. And you can kind of see that here as well. So even just using just a, a quick picture through the camera, you can kind of see how healthy plants are. You can see stars. Um, there's a mission here called uh, EcoStress, which is actually monitoring plant life from space. It flies over from the International Space Station, and it says, how are the plants doing underneath? And it looks at them with infrared light. Um, so, you know, we can kind of get a feel for, oh, like, are they, are they healthy? Or are, they, are we in a terrible drought? Spoiler alert. You really don't need a lot of data on California. But yeah, I mean, these types of scientific missions all just use light in different ways. In, in very simple, kind of simple terms. I think it's super, super cool. One more one, real quick, I want to tell you guys, so I got to hype up earth science as well, because our planet is super important. I've been very, very fortunate. I've gone on uh, the last couple of years on several expeditions, mapping our oceans and looking at like biological diversity in our, in our oceans as well. It's been super neat. A month at sea for two months. And when I say at sea, I mean 25 days, no land. So First two weeks are super exciting. The second two weeks, you're pretty much ready to get, get back. But we get to play with the coolest toys like these guys. So one, one handsome scientist shown for scale. This is our, our submersible. It's about seven feet by seven feet. It gets dropped off the back of the boat here off this A-frame. And it goes to the bottom of the ocean and can take samples. It can effectively has this weird terminator arm thing, right? That can break rocks and, uh, and be able to kind of uh, pull geological samples up we get to see all sorts of just crazy, crazy life down there. Uh, less than 20% of our oceans are mapped. You know, we're finding new things all the time, new life, these crazy new species of, of, uh, of marine biology. It's so cool. This is a great example of one. This is called a deep staria enigmatica. Uh, it's one of only a couple seen. Uh, it's this bright glowing jellyfish. And again, like we're two kilometers under the, under the water here, right? So the, it's just black as night. The only light is off the off the sub, and you can just see this like purple thing floating towards you. It was really creepy. Giant squids, of course, tons of sharks, all the good stuff for kids. But we we have all these really great activities based on Earth science as well because we we've got to right like our our planet is so important. We need to show people that. So for my last activity today, what I wanted to do with you guys is I wanted to ask you a climate science question. We'll see we'll see how you guys do. It's a tough one. I want you to imagine that you are on a boat in a lake. So you're you're not in the ocean, you're in a lake, you can see both sides, but you're standing there on a boat and you have a bunch of cargo on the boat and you throw it overboard. You're littering, not a good start to our climate problem. My question to you is, as you throw your cargo off the boat into the lake, does the water level go up, down, or stay the same. So you're on a boat, you're throwing stuff overboard. Does the water level go up, down, or stay the same? What do you guys think? Oh, early, early votes for the same, okay. No one's gonna take the others, huh? Okay, yeah, so like immeasurably up is a vote. Okay, cool, cool, I got you, Chris. There's no, there's no consequence that you guys can take a guess, right? Like, I'm not going to come and get you. Oh, okay. Like, I'll never help your school if you get this wrong. No, it's, you know, zero risk. All right, we got some ups, some stay the same. Let's find out. What I did is I made you a boat and I put it on a lake. So here is a, just a cup in the water. Let me kind of get it a little closer there. So just one of the little dentist Dixie cups and it's in the water here. And what I've done is, let me show you. Try not to get water on my keyboard here. Ooh, that's a bad idea. Let me show you from a distance. What I did is I put some cargo in there, just random nuts and bolts from my garage, right? So you've got some cargo in there. And like I said, what we're going to do is we're going to take my cargo here and I'm going to, what I, what I did real quick is I, I put a line you can see here. So that's our water level. So now I'm going to toss our cargo overboard and we'll see what happens to the water level. Everyone voted 
stays the same or barely up. And you guys were all incorrect. The water level actually goes down. And now that you guys see it, do you guys know why? Does anyone have a guess? And by the way, everyone gets this wrong. That's why I love this demo. Everyone always gets it wrong. But now that you see it, do you know why? I'll give you guys a little hint. Yeah, Chris, Chris is definitely, definitely pretty close there, right? Yeah, love it, love it, right? So now you can see it. Effectively, since the all the cargo on your boat displacing the volume of the boat. So as the boat got heavier, you were lifting the water. But now I've only displaced the volume of the cargo. So my boat floats higher and the cargo did lift the water a little bit. But the fact that I lost all of this displacement, it's going to drop down a lot. It's kind of cool, right? That's kind of cool to think about. And this is why sea level rise happens. This is sea level rise. New things are coming into the ocean and displacing new volume. So we just did sea level rise in reverse. That's why when ice melts in the ocean, it's not bad for sea level. It's obviously bad for the world, but it's not bad for sea level because that water has already displaced. But new water coming in and pushing down on our boat, that's, that's a problem. All right, cool. So those are big three demos I wanted to show you. And again, why am I showing you guys these? Because all of this total cost me $2 tops and like zero prep time. Like these are the kind of things that, that um, again, I, I just, I want to encourage you to go through the website. You can filter by demonstration. And if you're thinking to yourself, man, I've got, I've got a lecture today that's kind of intellectually tough and it's going to be tough for these kids. Just take a look and see, oh, I wonder if they have something to just kind of model this, right? That'll kind of take that intellectual load down a notch so that kids can maybe understand a little bit better. So that's kind of my, my, big, my big pitch to you guys. I hope it, uh, you guys enjoyed. And let me kind of take last minute questions for you guys and I'll put my email address in here. But thank you guys so much for your time, of course, of course. Anything at all on your minds uh, before, we, before we break? Anything else you guys want to talk about? It's okay. I kept mistyping. I keep missing the P in the top program. <laughs> You know, and the new, like with the new touchpad on the Macs, like my big, stupid, clumsy sausage fingers, I screw up everything. So, if anyone have any questions, that's the good opportunity to ask Brendan while he's here, or you can email him as well. Emily asked about education. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, um, I, as I mentioned, kind of like a chemist by education first. So I got my undergrad in chemistry uh, from Vanderbilt. I went and got my doctorate in chemistry from Northwestern. I was working in the private sector when I kind of felt that calling to, to be in education. So I went back and got a master's in education. Yeah, I've been kind of I effectively left the company to go teach high school. And they were like, what are you doing, bro? Like, there's no way that's the right choice. <laughs> like, I mean, they're like, okay, see you soon. You'll be back. But uh, no, so I started teaching high school chemistry. I've taught charters and Title I schools the entire time. I love it. I love being there for the students. And I think that what, what we have to do, is like we have to pay it forward for any, any of the good things that came to us so that we can open doors. And as my friend likes to say, you know, you got to lift when you rise. So that's, that's kind of got me back into teaching. I was very lucky because as I was teaching, uh, I got a phone call from NASA one day, which I totally thought was a prank call. And they said, come do both. You can be a scientist and a teacher for us. And that was uh, just a, a beautiful pitch. So it lets me live in both worlds. And I think that's actually really enriched my, my teaching practice. So I've been, been really, really happy with, with that support from JPL. Yeah. If you're trying to get into uh, NASA or JPL, uh, if you saw on the webpage, there's also like an interns page as well. And the general one, if you search, if you just Google NASA internship, that will be the, all the other NASA centers. JPL is the best one no big deal. But if you go to the education page I showed uh, right next to the teach and learn section at the top, there's an intern button as well, if you want to take a look. All right, guys. Well, I mean, yeah, again, I really appreciate your time. I think it's, oh, oh sorry. So I got one, one real quick. Do you find, oh, uh, so it's, it's like direct. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say who said it, but let me just kind of read the question. Do you find that your success in math and science is primarily due to going to schools where many of your peers do not look like you? And that is more than a, a four minute answer because I can get on this topic for a long time. But uh, yeah, abs absolutely. Um, I went to a very, very low income high school and then found myself in a very, very affluent, predominantly white college and graduate school. And it's an absolute culture shock. 
And one of the things that we really focus on at my school is getting them ready for that transition. Because I went from coasting through school where teachers barely cared or showed up to almost losing my academic scholarship because it was the first time I didn't know what was going on and I was out of my league and I didn't understand culturally what was happening around me. So yeah, that transition is absolutely tough. If you teach high school, please, please, please talk to your kids about this. Calibrate them for that transition as much as possible because it is not a success to graduate high school and then fail out your first year of college. So, you know, we're, we're trying to get them through college, not through high school. That is not the metric for me. So they, they need to know what that, that's going to look like. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. But I mean, again, I could talk on that. Yeah. But call, call me up if you want to, if you want to talk about these things and equity and science and representation, I'm, I'm happy to chat with you for sure. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending this session. Brendan, and thank you so very much for the demonstrations and for sharing your personal experience and your personal path to where you are now. I think it's important mm -hmm. that people know that it's not the easy path. It's not the straight way mm -hmm. through it. There is going to be a lot of challenges, but again, don't let anything stop you on what you want to do. And through the whole session, I kept saying, wow, that's amazing. That's cool. It's uh, so amazing that we have such an opportunity to discover the planet around that, our planet and our universe and the other universe. It's, it's, uh, it's just amazing. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. And if anyone would like to uh, tour the Jet Propulsion Laboratories, please, please visit the website that Brendan shared. It's jpl.nasa.gov to make an appointment or email directly to Brendan. We're going to take you on that. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Great, great. I hope to hear from you guys. Please reach out anytime. All right, have a good one. Enjoy the rest of the conference. I'll see you guys in some other talks. Thank you, everyone. We have more sessions. Hope to see you there. Bye, guys.